Hi everyone, I'm Nick Alexander, a postdoc here in the Maguire lab, and I've been working with EEG and OPM MEG data um, for a while now. And today I'm going to be telling you all about, well, what I've learned about the pre-processing of these data in SPM. And, you know, what do I mean by pre-processing? Well, I suppose it's simply the signal processing steps which occur after you've collected your data um, and before you do your analysis. So I suppose that's it. Um, and what's involved in pre-processing? Well, you should have some data set. Maybe you downloaded it, maybe you've, or maybe you're planning it. Um, but yeah, you should have some data set, which will be a bunch of files, including some kind of raw uh, neural time series data, as well as some sort of peripheral information about I don't know, event timings, um, perhaps like, you know, a table of timings or an extra channel in your data. You might for EEG have electrode labels to tell you where where those channels were recorded from. Um, for MEG, uh, you may also have positions and orientations, information about grad structures, that kind of thing. And you may also have uh, knowledge about the anatomy you've been recording from and where that is in relation to those channels. Anyway, the most important thing that you'll have is um, some knowledge about what it is you've actually recorded and it might you know it might seem kind of obvious um, but that's going to guide all of your pre-processing as well as your analysis hopefully you know a little bit about um, what the signals you've actually well some of the properties of the signals you've attempted to measure and you should hopefully also know something about the the noise environment in which you um, you were kind of forced to record those signals uh, along with. And yeah, like I say, that's going to guide everything you do. And there's no one size fits all sort of standard pre-processing pipeline um, in EEG and MEG. Um, although there, I guess there are enough commonalities across recordings that, yeah, there are a few sort of standard principles, which um, I guess I'll, I'll raise as we go along. But I just want to say, you know, you're going to be the person who who knows your data best and yeah just kind of go with what go with what you think's best and what other people have done in the past anyway the, the idea is that at the end of it you're going to end up with an isolated signal um, and that's going to allow you to run your analysis sort of across your across your design and you'll hear about how to do that in some of the later talks and um yeah why do it what am i what am I even going to be talking about? Um, some people have suggested perhaps that certainly in the case of EEG, um, good luck with MEG, but certainly in the case of EEG, it could be better to kind of leave the data alone. Um, and this is essentially a paper which um, presents quite a, a clean data set um, with a nice simple experimental design and shows that if you just apply, I think it's a, a high pass filter and then just use averaging across lots of trials, you can get the same result that you'd get as if you kind of, I'm not sure, maybe they, I think they manually went through and also applied some sort of semi-automated methods um, to remove artifacts, to, to select bad channels, bad segments, all that kind of stuff, um, and show that, yeah, it, it doesn't help. Um, so yeah, what, why do it if that's enough? And yeah, it's enough if your data is clean and you've got lots of trials and a simple design. Um, but you'll usually find that artifacts in your data are not a small problem um, that you need to get around. You'll find that they're orders of magnitude larger <laughs> than, than any of the signals in your data normally. <clears throat> so these might be these might be physiological. So that would be signals arising from other parts in the body. Uh, it's not just the brain that produces kind of electrophysiological signals. Um, unfortunately, persistence, there's, there's the heart, so ECG or EKG, and there's also muscle activity. So muscles from the neck in particular are a problem um, in EEG data sets. And there might also be nothing to do with, you know, what you were trying to record or, um, or anything from, from the subject. They could be non-physiological, they could be reflecting some real other magnetic or electrical um, 
source in the world. So light noise, for example, that kind of 50 hertz AC um, source, which we, we, we tend to pick up with EEG and MEG, unfortunately. Um, 50 hertz in the UK. Or perhaps it's something which is not, you know, not real at all. It's just a property of your system. So that could be something like a squid jump from a from an electric neuromag system. That that didn't really happen in the real world, but unfortunately you you measured it. And these are these are massive signals, much bigger than anything the brain's producing. Um, oh, go back a second. Won't let me. Um, okay, so. You know these these artifacts. I'll just I'll just raise these artifacts. Often have a design of their own. You know they're not just randomly distributed throughout all of your conditions. It might be the case that sometimes there's more of an artifact in one condition than another. Think about a task where there's some um, surprise. You're looking at the surprise trials and you're comparing them against trials without surprise. Maybe people blink more in those trials um, through surprise. Now that blink is going to produce um, an artifact as well, as I'll kind of touch on later. And if you don't remove it, it doesn't matter how much averaging you do, you're going to average that, that blink into your data as well. Um, yeah, so you're, you're going to need to remove that blink. Um, anyway, just another nice thing about pre-processing is that after you've kind of gone through everything in SPM, you're going to end up with just a dot dat and a dot map file for your data set, maybe lots of images and all that kind of thing. But it will be something which will be interpretable by lots of people, especially if they've done this course. Um, but at the start, I mean, what you've got right now is you've got a lot of files and you know what they all mean. Um, but trust me, maybe in a year um, or two years, even you won't know. Um, so it's quite nice that pre-processing also kind of organizes your data for you, I think. Um, yeah which is quite nice. Okay, so what, 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 do I, what do I like to think? What have I, what have I learned about pre-processing? Um, so it's generally advisable to treat all data the same. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, usually you'll be making a batch or running the same script, applying the same filters to all conditions. And in that sense, you're treating all data the same, right? And that's important because, as I say, these artifacts in your data might be orders of magnitude larger than the signals. So if somehow you attenuate an artifact 80% in one condition and 90% in another, you'll very likely find a difference, um, but it's nothing to do with the signals you were trying to measure. I guess it's, obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that, really, but that's but that's the idea. So you might be thinking, well, as long as I just apply the same things to to all my data sets, um, that'll be OK. But you might find that you've actually um, designed, say, your filter parameters based on one condition rather than another. And I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that on a later slide. Um, and you, there's actually often some manual steps when you're when you're doing your pre-processing. So that might be visually inspecting your, your data and selecting bad trials. And then if you're going to be doing that over a, a week, you might find that the principles that you're, you're applying to select those bad segments can change. Um, and you'll have to be really careful about that. So again, I'll come on to that a bit later. Anyway, treat all data the same. That's, that's the aim anyway. It's also quite nice to check um, what each pre-processing step is actually doing. So this is quite nice in SPM. You can visualize your data in some way or in MATLAB or however you prefer um, before and after each step. Apply a filter or rather, you know, plot, plot your, um, your time series you know, in, in segments. Um, have a look at that, be familiar with it. Apply a filter to your data, plot it again. See if it makes sense. And that's that's nice, not just so you know what you've done, um, but also to check you haven't made a mistake. You know, maybe in the GUI you added a zero uh, where you shouldn't have. Um, and you've got a 10 hertz, not a one hertz low pass filter. High pass filter. Um, so that's a good idea generally. And it's also good to think about how different pre-processing steps interact. And I'll kind of highlight these as we go along. Sometimes these technically matter, but 
you know you can do it both ways and you'll see there's there's it's not going to affect your results but other times it really is important um and i'll yeah i'll try and highlight that as we go along um and really importantly uh, ensure that you're able to report what you've done to people um and also be willing to defend it because you'll often find a reviewer will say oh you did that if you've really, if you've managed to report it properly they'll say oh you've done that i wouldn't have done that why did you do it um so you should be yeah willing to justify um each step that you take and i put the part about um, making sure that it's replicable as well um that's particularly important for manual steps you'll want to make sure that you're able to sufficiently describe what you did don't just say you visually inspected or ideally don't just say you visually inspected bad trials try and say what you used to to determine a bad trial if you can for example okay so what steps are we going to cover uh, in this talk um well i was thinking about how to do this and I'm going to go a little further than just sort of saying what can be done in SPM and and you know recommending parameters and all that kind of thing because that's going to be covered in in kind of the walkthroughs and the practical sessions. Um, so instead, I'm going to yeah go through a few of them and go into some depth and hopefully an appropriate amount of depth um, as to what's actually being done at each pre-processing step um, and what you need to consider and yeah. Hopefully that will go OK, but briefly we're going to cover um, or I'm going to cover digital sampling and resampling. Temporal filters or filters usually um, how to identify bad channels, epoching your data, um, re-referencing um, specific to EEG. Um, so sorry, MEG people. And also then just the very broad topic of dealing with artifacts. Um, yeah. But before I get to that, um, let's talk about what's happened to your data so far. So I kind of said that pre-processing is, um, you know, the series of signal processing steps that you take after you've recorded your data and, you know, before you do your analysis. But usually there's actually been some kind of pre-processing which has occurred before you've, um, before you've exported your data from your system. So I'm going to talk about these two a bit later, so sampling frequency, um, that's kind of predetermined unless you've not collected your data yet. Um, but I'll go through all the considerations that you need to have for that on the next slide. Um, hardware filters, so essentially a kind of an electrical temporal filter, and um, these will often have been applied. And again, I'll talk about them on a later slide. What I won't talk about though is uh, uh, electrode impedance, and you just kind of need to be aware of this. So when you um, record EEG, hopefully your system will record the impedance of the electrodes at the start um, and maybe at the end of a recording. And you should keep an eye on these and you should note them down so that you can check that you've got them all under five kilo ohms or, or, maybe, a, or maybe 10 kilo ohms, but ideally less than five. And why is that? Well, it's particularly important for low frequencies, as you can see in this nice figure from Kappenman and Luck. So what they've done there, and um, you could ignore the stuff about temperature, but they've essentially recorded the same signals from the same people with high impedance and low impedance electrode um, setups. And you can see that for the, the low frequencies, um, that kind of effect on resistance that um, varies across frequency that impedance has, um, it's uh, added noise essentially to the high impedance electrodes. Um, for those kind of sub 10 hertz frequencies. And you can imagine how that might be a problem um, if that varied across, across your conditions um, or even across sort of units of observation, uh, it would be quite problematic. So make sure your uh, impedance is low um, and certainly make sure you record it. Also be aware, and I, I'll talk about this on the re-referencing slide a bit more, um, but be aware of what your online reference was. Usually it actually doesn't really matter too much um, because you can you can re-reference, but you do need to know what it was. All this information should be, uh, you know, the sampling frequency um, and the, the the online reference. All of that that kind of thing should be stored in your files and SPM. We'll read it in, hopefully. Um, anyway, for for MEG data, 
you should be aware that um, some kind of signal space separation, um, SSS or max filter or a Maxwell filter, depending on, on what you've used, will have been implemented. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, but essentially all that does is it takes Maxwell's equations and spherical harmonics and it uses those to model your data as um, two spaces, internal and external. And the idea is that if all goes well, I'm sorry, if all goes well, um, the internal space will contain all of your signals of interest and the external space will contain noise. And by separating them, you can obviously dismiss the, dismiss the noise. And you can see this has a drastic effect on your data. Um, so in this, this nice paper from Jazz and colleagues, um, which compares a bunch of different pre-processing steps, um, well worth looking at. You can see how uh, Max filter or Maxwell filters um, with their different implementations, yeah, drastically affect your data. So be aware of those parameters um, as of what's happened to your data before it reaches SPM. Anyway, let's talk about um, digital sampling and resampling. So um, there's not a huge amount to say about this, I guess, um, but I'm going to try. Uh, consider that the, the kind of the real signals um, in the world, they're, they're analog, they're continuous in nature. Um, but the way in which we record our data is pretty much always um, discrete. We take sort of little bite-sized pieces of that data at a time um, and digitize it. And I say most because um, Know, early electrophysical, electro, electrophysiological um, recordings, not just EEG, but like ECG and that kind of thing. Um, they would have been done using some sort of electrometer, which would have actually, you know, scrawled on a bit of paper, um, and that would be an analog recording. Uh, anyway, everything you'll be doing in SPM will be, of course, digital, and hopefully it will have equidistant sampling. Um, I'm only mentioning this uh, because it allows us to talk about Hertz. So the idea, the idea being that the, the space and time between each sample should be equivalent throughout your whole recording. Um, you don't want to sample, you know, 20, 20, 20 milliseconds and then 21 milliseconds later you do another sample and then back to 20. It will always be uniform, hopefully. Um, and when I say Hertz, that just means um, samples per second or the the inverse of the time between samples so 20 hertz 20 samples per second anyway um so you might think oh maybe i'll just sample at the highest rate i can um, and that's not a good idea because the lower your sampling rate the, the more efficient everything's going to be um, not just in terms of disk space uh, you know, we can end up with some pretty large files in neuroimaging um, but also in terms of how long it will take to run these pre-processing steps, perhaps some of your analyses, depending on what you're doing, it can really slow things down. And you'll spend a lot of time just looking at that kind of progress bar in, in, in SPM. So you want it to be as low as you, low as you can make it, really. Um, and there's really only one rule, which everyone will say follow, which is um, uh, Nyquist Shannon. So the idea here is that you need to exceed the Nyquist rate, which means you need to double the highest frequency of interest that you'd like to observe without aliasing. What does that mean? Um, well, I've got this, this nice um, practical example for you on the right. So here, the sort of dark blue line on the left panels um, is a, an analog recording. It's actually you know, just very highly sampled and it's a 20 Hertz sinusoid um, we can just see a snippet of it here. I've also added some noise. And I've shown um, what happens if you try and sample that at 30 hertz, which would be below the Nyquist, um, the Nyquist rate. And you can see that if you were to connect those red dots together, kind of in your mind, I've not done it. Um, if you were to connect those red dots together, you would see that we don't actually have much, if any, information about this, the original 20 hertz signal. Um, and indeed, if you if you look at the right at the power spectral density, um, which just shows the power per frequency band or sorry, power per frequency, 
um, you can see that it's kind of introduced this this peak at 10 hertz as well as we're actually managing to produce some information about the 20 hertz um, and that's aliasing it's some interaction between the sampling rate and the the, the, the signal of interest which is above the Nyquist rate um, yeah so you can see why that might be an issue um, and then if you were to sample at a higher rate say 64 Hertz which is now above the Nyquist rate you will see that yeah it looks like we've got um, a nice kind of summary of that analog signal if you were to connect those green dots together and on the right you can see there's no phantom piece there's nothing strange going on it's a pretty much a perfect um, it's pretty much perfectly captured that peak at 20 Hertz um, and it matches the blue so that's good and if you were to increase the sampling rate again to say 128 Hertz you can see yes it's the same deal um, it looks a little nicer in the time domain um, but really no extra information has been captured so I suppose in this case you might think yeah let's go with the green what does this mean practically for for actually doing EEG and MEG um, because if you think oh well the, the the signal I'd like to observe, maybe I'll only be looking at alpha 12 hertz or 10, 10, 10 hertz being the central frequency. Oh, then I just need to sample at 20. Uh, yeah, I don't actually know what would happen if you did that, but I guess all of those high frequency signals would alias. So then you might think, okay, I have to double the sampling frequency. Um, I have to set my sample frequency at double the highest sort of noise that I've recorded. But by the time you've got 50 hertz and it's harmonics and other high frequency signals, that'd be a very high high rate. So to be honest, what I think most people do is they just they just go with 500, um, or they will um, say start at the original sampling rate, a thousand, and then they will um, plot the PSD and then downsample to 200, plot the PSD again, see if any aliasing has occurred. Um, but yeah. To be honest, people talk about the Nyquist rate and then it seems to never be used. So yeah, with a pinch of salt, I guess. Um, oh yeah, there is there is another consideration. So it's actually not just the Nyquist rate, that's not the only parameter you need to think about, um, sampling rate specifically. It's um, You should also think about the interaction between the number of samples that you have and uh, the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. So PSDs, that was kind of the PSDs I was showing on the previous slide, um, those are based on extremely long time series, not just that 200 millisecond um, snippet which I showed. And that allows, uh, allows you to get a, um, a nice kind of high resolution um, discrete Fourier transform, which is what you can see on the right. Um, it's got a nice sharp estimate of, um, of amplitude by frequency. But it's actually the case that um, yeah, there's sort of a, almost a one-to-one -one mapping um, of the number of samples in the time domain and the resolution of your Fourier transform, and you can see that here. So in this situation, we've got um, well, we've got a couple of variables. So moving from left to right, I've taken the duration of a time series, so 100 milliseconds on the left, 400 milliseconds in the middle, and um, just over a second on the right and uh, moving from top to bottom you've got a sampling rate so 500 hertz 2000 hertz 8000 hertz and what you can see is that where i've i've um i've put in a 180 hertz uh, sine wave signal so i've got a high frequency signal you can see that when you've got a short um a short duration even though the um we've exceeded the Nyquist rate by quite a bit with 500 Hertz. We can't see a peak there at all. And even as you increase the sampling rate to well above um, the Nyquist rate, 2000 Hertz in this case, you can see we can, we can see a bit of a peak, but you wouldn't want to do, uh, you wouldn't want to rely on it too much because some noise might exceed that. And it really, it only becomes the case that once you have um, a lot more samples, so in this case, 1.2 seconds and 8,000 hertz that you can start to get a good estimate um, of that peak. So just just think about that if it's going to um, be relevant to, to your work. Right, 
let's talk about temporal filters. So this is a massive subject. Um, temporal filters are everywhere, um, not just in neuroscience, of course. And you know, why is that? What are they good for? So often, you know, we record things in the time domain, and you can think of what we record as the sum of many periodic signals. Essentially, lots of sine waves all summed together. Um, not, you know, not in phase, they have their phase and their amplitude. And yeah, it can look messy. If you want to do your analysis in the time domain, um, you, you won't necessarily be able to do it if you want to just look at one of those signals. But if you look in the spectral domain, um, so this PSD on the right, um, you can actually see that in this case where we've got a 10 hertz and a 50 hertz signal, you can see they're actually really nicely separated. Um, that's the kind of thing you'd want to analyze, right? Um, so how do we take this nice separation and apply it back to the temporal domain on the left? Um, well, we can apply temporal filters, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more on the next slide. But generally speaking, you want to design a filter so that it preserves um, a passband. So a passband being a, a range of frequencies which you would like to yeah. keep all of that information exactly the same. And you want to attenuate the stop band. So the stop band being those frequencies which you would like to kind of decimate. Um, and that allows us to talk about high pass filters, which attenuate low frequencies and low pass filters, which attenuate high frequencies. You've also got band pass filters, which kind of have two stop bands. So a stop, a stop band either side of a pass band. And you have band stop filters, which have um, two pass bands and one stop band. And yeah, you can see these are extremely powerful. So in the green, um, I've just made a, um, a high pass filter at 30 hertz. Kind of strange, you would probably never do this, but you can see that it has um, attenuated those lower frequencies um, in the spectral domain. And also you can see they're no longer present in the temporal domain which is brilliant, isolated the signal perfectly. And likewise, if I were to flip that round, so in the black I have, again, I think it's at 30 Hertz, and instead it is now a low pass filter. And you can see that all of that remains are those, is that kind of low frequency sine wave. Brilliant. Okay, but how do they work? Um, they're not just magic. Um, I think fortunately, in, in the simplest case, they're actually quite easy to understand. Um, filters just use a, temporal filters just use a moving weighted sum of samples, which is a type of convolution. And that transforms some input signal to produce an output. And in these, these lovely figures from de Chavan and Nelkin, which is another paper which you should definitely read if you're interested in temporal filters. Um, they kind of take you through exactly how they work, how to report them, all that kind of thing in a lot more detail than I can here. Um, anyway, in this filter, uh, in this in this figure, you can see that um, because it's a moving weighted sum or average, um, the many many samples from the input affect a single sample in the output. So that's kind of what you can see in the top. And another way of phrasing that is, for every sample in the input, there are many outputs. Uh, output samples which um, are determined by it and that necessarily means that filters are going to sort of smooth your data or smear your data um, through time they drastically change uh, yeah what you've recorded um, and just to say that the, these weights are essentially the, the filter design um, and they're, they're, they're normally called the the impulse response um, and briefly, they're called the impulse response because if you were to set your input to be you know, all zeros, one, one, an impulse, and then all zeros again, um, by applying uh, the filter to that impulse, about that impulse, you would then see the weights in the output. Anyway, um, so as I say, the signal is, is now smeared across time. And that means that the exact type of filter and the way it's done um, can affect um, yeah, the timings of, say, the peak of an ERP.
So it's a nice figure from Akunzo and colleagues. Uh, you can see that in the original data, in the red, the peak is actually sort of slightly ahead in time. Is that right? Hmm. I'd have thought it'd be the other way around. Anyway, um, and in the black, um, you can see the peak has actually shifted after applying what's called a causal filter. So a causal filter can only apply weights to samples which have occurred um, before it in time. Um, you know, that's kind of a take on uh, electrical filters, which kind of happen in real time, and they can, of course, only consider um, previous uh, samples, I suppose. And um, the other thing you can do is you can apply a filter forwards if you've already recorded it, and then backwards, um, or essentially have weights either side of the output. Um, and what this, this means is, yeah, the, the peak isn't going to shift around, but something kind of weird happens in that you've got, um, you've got a time point in the present now affecting samples that occurred before it. So again, you, sh you should think about how that's going to affect your analysis. If perhaps you're, you're trying to decode something and find out exactly when it happens, think about whether essentially the, your use of a filter has meant that decoder now has information from the future at a current sample. Um, yeah, all sorts of strange things can happen. Anyway, um, how are filters implemented in SPM? Um, well, this is where that example breaks down a bit, to be honest, um, but the principles, the principles do remain. So SPM uses Butterworth filters, which were originally electrical filters um, designed by Butterworth in the 30s, and they're optimized to preserve the pass band and uh, attenuate the stop bands to kind of a maximal extent. And they're also, they try and minimize what's called the transition band, which is that sort of gradient between the, the pass band and the stop band. So you don't really need to know um, exactly how they work, um, but I guess be aware that they have an infinite impulse response. So like I say, that nice simple example I had with those weightings, it kind of breaks down a bit because that weighting is now of infinite length. Although in reality, it does, it does tend towards zero. Um, yeah. So SPM implements these filters for everything by default. So for um, band pass, band stop, high pass and low pass filters. Uh, essentially it uses filt filt in MATLAB, which is an acausal or bidirectional filter. Um, so it was kind of that second example from the Akunzo paper. And the default order of the filter um, is five in SPM. And what do I mean by order? Well, uh, again, I'm not going to go into it, it's not really my world, to be honest. Um, but the filter order determines um, the gradient of that transition band. So a filter of order two, uh, or a filter of order four, has uh, twice as steep a gradient as a filter of order two. And so you might think, you know, why don't I just always apply, you know, why don't we do a filter of order 10? Um, and the reason for that is computationally it becomes quite, um, yeah, intense um, and also the the stability of the filter breaks down um, and briefly that's just because there's some feedback um, ongoing feedback that occurs when designing a Butterworth filter between the data and the filter parameters um, and yeah that gets increasingly complicated um, as you increase the order so anyway practically I would just leave everything on the defaults um, and just try and filter out yeah anything that isn't your signal And what are the considerations to have when using these temporal filters? Because like I say, they, they, they drastically, drastically change your data. It's well worth looking at your data first, applying a filter and then looking at it again and you'll see it, it, it looks like a totally different data set. And that's because essentially it is. Um, this is actually something I mentioned, I think earlier, um, where if you design a filter for just one of your conditions and then apply it to all of them, you may find that, yeah, you're going to affect your results. So again, in this, this example from Akunzo, they show that um, depending on whether you apply a high pass filter at one hertz or not, and they had loads of examples, um, you either find a difference in the ERP, um, in the happy condition in this case, versus fearful and neutral, or you don't, 
And that's because there's some low frequency signal in the happy condition, which isn't present in the others. So yeah, I think this is quite an extreme example. Um, and hopefully, uh, normally you've got kind of the same signal properties that are just being modulated in some way across your conditions. Um, but if not, be, 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 be aware of what, what might happen. Um, and I think the best thing to do is just look at what other people have done in, in your field. And this is why it's, it's nice when people report all of these, these things fully. Um, and yeah, always, always make sure that you report everything fully so that people can be aware of what you've done. Because it might be that, yeah, these pre-processing steps are actually incredibly important. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, okay, so it's very important to identify bad channels in your data. Um, what I mean by bad, well, in EEG, maybe a, a cable, you know, a lead was moving and you've got some cable artifacts. Um, I think if you attend some of the OPM MEG talks and demos uh, in this course, you might hear about some of the system specific issues that we've had uh, there regarding bad channels. Um, generally speaking, it's very obvious. There's just one of your channels is standing out, like you can see here in the red. Um, as having some sporadic noise, or perhaps if you were to look at the power spectral density, um, all your channels, you might see that a couple of them are um, significantly higher than others, and there's just something wrong with those channels. Often, actually, it's the case that you just sort of given a list, so you use um, use your your local Squid MEG system, and it might be that you're given a list of um, channels which are, are very likely to be bad and which you should just remove. Anyway, there's, there's kind of a balance to be struck here between removing channels, and you, you know, you have them for a reason. Um, you have them to get good spatial sampling, um, high dimensionality in your data. Um, you, don't, you don't just want to be removing them. So there's a balance between keeping trials in and removing more time points. And generally speaking, if you remove a time point, you remove that time point from, from all channels. All, you know, all you could remove essentially this segment. Uh, and it, I'm not sure you can see my mouse. You essentially remove a whole trial rather than just one one channel, and there's a balance there, and there's no right answer, I'm afraid. You just have to, um, yeah, go in with some principled approach. Either remove all bad channels, um, or all bad trials, yeah, or something in the middle. Um, but whatever you do, do it early. Um, this is where it really interacts with other pre-processing steps. So especially where you've got um, a spatial filter, um, something like a max filter, you don't want bad channels in there because they're going to sort of project <laughs> across many other channels and um, then you'll have lots of bad channels, I guess, and you might not even be able to identify them. So that would be a problem. Um, and you should also think about when Kind of the order of applying filters before you start to identify bad channels. So in SPM, there's a few automated methods um, and these might say look for squid jumps. So that'd be quite easy. A squid jump is a kind of a rapid increase um, from one sample to the next. So you could just look at, you know, diff in MATLAB and that would find kind of a quick rise and you could say that's, that's when the squid jump occurred. So now remove 50 milliseconds either side of that, something like that. However, if you've applied for some filters, some temporal filters to your data, you might find that transition is no longer so sharp and these automated methods, um, they might struggle to, to identify that squid jump. Uh, the same applies to eye blinks, um, whether you're doing that visually or automated, filters are going to really drastically affect what those eye blinks look like. So just be aware of that. Um, and then, yeah. Epoching data. So this this kind of comes into averaging and and various other things, but it's pretty much the most powerful thing you can do, I guess. Um, so I mentioned earlier that you're going to have some knowledge of um, what's happened um, when in your data. So some events table, which will be when a stimulus was presented or when a person responded. And hopefully you've got lots of these. Um, and in order to average across them, we we do some epoching, and epoching is not really a word. Um, it only seems to exist in EG and MEG. Um, I guess it's making epochs. Um, and usually you define 
a start point and then you can sometimes go back a bit uh, often a baseline period or just some kind of pan event time and then you go forward by sunset sunset period and SPM kind of likes these to all be of the same length by the way um, so think about that when designing your experiments and yeah there's not too much to say about it other than of course this allows you to do some stats could be as simple as just averaging across epochs within two conditions doing a t-test between them um, or maybe you want to preserve all of the epochs and they all kind of go into a GLM um, but you'll hear all about that in, in some of the other talks I guess the only thing you should be aware is that often when you chop up your data um, like this there's some baseline correction that goes on um, that could be based on the mean of a baseline period say the second before an event it'll take the mean of all those samples and subtract it from the whole data or it could be it could be the mean of all samples in the epoch um, so just be aware that I guess if you were to stitch them all back together they would be they'd be offset in some way yeah right so uh, let's talk about this is a bit of a, a bit of a change in pace but let's talk about um, referencing and re-referencing of EG so practically speaking this is all very easily handled in SPM um, so you should know what the online reference was and I'm going to talk about what that means in a moment but you should know what it is and you should decide whether you're going to re-reference to some other scheme or, or montage so generally speaking if you're going to do some kind of source analysis um, you will want to use the kind of the common reference or the common average reference which takes um, the voltage from all channels and which will have a mean of zero and uses that as the reference to each of the individual channels and from that you kind of get an absolute measurement um, often for just doing a sensor level analysis there's sort of well there's a lot more approaches but generally speaking people like to um, use the average of kind of a, a right and a left reference which would often be um, M1 and M2 the mastoids or it could be earlobes and um, something which isn't going to have too much um, neural or muscle activity and which isn't um, kind of spatially biased I guess that's why it's the average of, of the two sides and um, whereas you'll often find that the online references say CPZ right in the middle um, however, for central level analysis, you can also take a common average, and that's what I normally do personally. Right, but what does all this mean? Um, so you may, this hopefully was covered in one of the earlier talks um, about the sort of the origins of these signals, um, but just to recap, EG is essentially measuring, at each electrode, you're measuring a, a relative potential between two, between two points, two electrodes. So if it's online, it was you know, CPZ, something like that. Um, and um, T7, it's the relative potential between these two points. But not really. Um, that's, actually not, that's actually not the case um, because there's also the ground. Um, and this really is kind of getting into the weeds and it does not matter. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting and something worth being aware of. So when amplifying a referential signal like like what i've just described one side of that i don't know the details of electronics to be honest with you but one side of that is kind of bound to the um the common ground in the amplifier and that will contain a lot of electrical noise um, all these circuits just contain a lot of noise which you do not want in your data so essentially you've got um, if you were to just do your active to your reference, the reference is going to contain a lot of noise. So when you do active minus reference, you're going to be left with the difference between the two um, in terms of what's, what's going on at the scalp plus negative noise, so essentially just plus noise, which is a problem. Um, so how do you get around that? Um, so I think they're called uh, dif differential amplifiers. So these will um, take two referential signals. So instead of doing the active um, with reference to the reference, sorry, you do the active with reference to a ground 
and we call it the ground. It's kind of a virtual ground, a little bit odd. Um, anyway, that's just another another position on that on the scalp. Um, and that means that now all of that noise is in the in the ground. The ground is being treated as the reference. And then you also do the reference versus the ground. So in this case, the ground is the reference. Bear with me. And in, again, in this case, the ground has all of that electrical noise. So at this point, you've got A minus G and R minus G. So in order to recover A minus R, you do A minus G minus R minus G leaving you with A minus R. Um, yeah, I've explained it now. You probably never need to think about it again. Um, I think it's kind of cool though. Yeah, so you should be aware. Um, oh, I've already talked about this. Yeah, so you can use the common average, which you can just do very simply in SPM by selecting all of them. Or for sensor level, you might do M1 plus M2, or the common average. Um, if you're doing some, some clinical work, maybe, which is very unlikely in a, in a research setting, but say you are, just you be aware that you can specify some quite interesting montages. Um, this one's called the double banana, um, which you can see on the right. So this would allow you to look at things like uh, a phase reversal. Um, so they sort of reference from, in this case, FP2 to F4 f4 to c4 c4 to p4 and you can imagine how if there was some signal in the middle here that the phase of that signal will switch as you move along but like i say not really used in a research setting just just kind of interesting right so this is a uh, back you know meg people can can wake up um because this affects everybody. So how do we actually deal with artifacts specifically? I talked about filters and that will actually help deal with artifacts. I've talked about epoching. That might help a little bit. Um, but yeah, sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, artifacts kind of have their own design, which gets around all of these things. Perhaps they overlap in, um, uh, in time sometimes maybe more in one condition than a condition than another maybe you sometimes you can't filter them out like an eye blink which occurs at low frequencies um and maybe you're looking at theta you know you can't apply a temporal filter there to remove the eye blink um so what can you do um there isn't a right way to do this um you you can either try and remove all contaminated segments, um, so all sort of time points or trials which contain an artifact, and then you might lose, I don't know, half your trials, um, or maybe you won't lose many at all. It really entirely depends on your paradigm. I'd say if you're not gonna lose many at all, do this. If you're gonna lose half, try something else. So that something else is um, trying to correct or, or remove artifacts um, from your time series without removing whole time points. And to do that, you usually use some spatial information, which I'll talk about. And the other thing you can do is you can just ignore the issue. Um, like I say, that will probably only work if you've got really clean data um, or if they don't have any sort of design of their own. And then you can just use the power of averaging, averaging across all of those epochs. And that really will, will help a lot. Um, yeah, so here's just a nice uh, example I've borrowed from from somebody else's slides, but um, you can see you can see here how um, different um, artifacts kind of appear in your time series. This kind of requires some expertise, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but you might have some continuous muscle activity, which is this kind of high frequency signal you can see, or a transient sort of that almost looks like the jaw to me, um, sort of burst of muscle activity, an eye blink. Um, that looks like a filtered eye blink to me, um, quite a low frequency, kind of half a second duration um, artifact. And then you've got your ongoing signal, something like alpha, which is often visible in the time series. Um, yeah, so you can see it might be a bit of an issue. So in the simplest case, just rejecting, say, all trials that contain, contain artifacts. Um, to do that, you first need to identify all those time periods. Um, which is not necessarily simple. Um, so one way, you know, you can kind of look at that, that that time series on the previous slide and you can imagine you might be able to just select time periods that contain an eye blink or muscle activity. Um, and yeah, you could then just say, 
If uh, a trial contains any of those, remove the trial. Fine. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of what I like to do, I think. Um, usually when you've spent so long designing an experiment, so long collecting that data, you're going to be spending a long time analyzing it. Spending a week or, or something like that, or depending on how much data you have, just scrolling through and labeling bad, bad segments is well worth doing. Um, yeah, there are automated methods as well. Um, certainly plenty in SVM to look for things like eye blinks. Um, and again, just consider how earlier pre-processing steps, pre-processing steps like filtering, etc., cetera, um, influence that. Um, there's also kind of semi-automated methods. So this is actually from Field Trip, but it's you know it's in the SBM manual. It's uh, highly compatible with with, with SBM. You can use this um, uh, reject visual function in Field Trip, which allows you to create a, a summary statistic um, across trials and across channels, um, and it allows you to then just sort of drag and select uh, anything which looks a bit out of the ordinary. Um, in a, in a, in a semi-principled way. So in this sense, you could say, oh, I plotted the kurtosis of all trials and I selected, I removed trials with a kurtosis of greater than X. Um, yeah, so you can do that and then you can use that to just reject any data. Fine. But what do you, what do, you do if you if doing that would be impractical? Um, so you've got some one-shot learning paradigm or something like this and you don't want to remove too many trials. Um, well, in SPM, um, you, can, you can do a few different things. Um, one is to use um, SSP, signal space projection. So I think this is going to be covered in the demo, but briefly, um, you use some automated or manual procedure to select um, artifacts, and rather than removing them, you sort of just you treat them as an event and you can sort of get some pan um, artifactual set of trials almost. And you use these to um, build a couple of um, subspaces um, orthogonal to each other, and then you remove the one which contains the, the artifactual data. Um, yeah, and, and that works really well, it's very efficient. Uh, another common approach is um, to use ICA, but that's to do that, you'll have to use some external tools. So in field trip, it's often used for yeah, removing artifacts. Um, and there's actually automated methods, particularly for EEG, um, so IC label, implemented in EEG lab. Um, and that's not only used for rejecting, rejecting artifacts, it's actually also used for kind of isolating and, and collating um, neural activity as well, which is, yeah, an interesting approach. Um, and just consider how these methods affect the, the rank of your data, because you're essentially removing um, some piece of information across all channels. So you're reducing the dimensionality of your data. Um, and you just need to be aware that if you remove loads and loads of components, you might need to change some later parameters um, when doing a source analysis. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, these are powerful tools. ICA is probably the most common method, to be honest. Um, yeah, but not in SBM. Um, yeah, okay, so I think I'll just leave it there. Um, I'll be around hopefully to uh, answer any questions that you have. And yeah, thank you for listening.